Good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today is the 11th day of the month of January 2023, and we are, we are starting a new topic. We are looking at meetings of companies, meetings of companies, and uh, we will see how God will help us. We'll meet today, and we'll meet tomorrow. We should meet tomorrow for maybe one hour, and we should be done with meetings this week. I want to believe that you have had time to listen to the videos, and uh, so we shouldn't have so much problems. But by way of introduction, just to emphasize that companies are presumed to be associations of persons. They are associations of persons that upon registration are conferred with a corporate personality. So what is uh, conferred with the personality is the association of the persons. That uh, association is through a process of registration conferred with a personality and we also emphasized that this entity <clears throat> is mandated by law to have uh, directors to appoint a number of persons to direct its affairs. These members who come together to form the company, they have rights. They have rights in the company and uh, among other things we said that membership <clears throat> will give you a right to be involved in governance one of those core rights of membership is the right to be involved in governing the entity. Okay, now a person who invests his money in a company as a creditor will only have pecuniary rights or entitlements from it. You will be entitled to be paid back interest and at the end of everything is principal sum advanced to the entity. For a member, on the other hand, it's not the same. He has rights in the entity. He has rights to be involved in governing the entity. Every member must have a say <coughs> in governance of the company. For us, anyway, it's not like that everywhere. I told us that in some countries, you could issue non-voting shares. You remember we said that? Did we say that? Yes. Yes, and uh, for such shares, the holders will only have a right to a uh, pecuniary uh, distribution, right to funds, but they cannot have the right to governance. When we move over to the company, on the other hand, uh, it's a different ballgame entirely. Company law and, uh, envisages that every member should be involved in governance. And how this is usually done, is through is true meetings. Are you with me? Meetings, because meetings that we see create uh, platforms and opportunities for members to be able to have a say in the governance of companies that they have uh, invested their funds in. So again, by way of emphasis, the company has two core organs. The company has two core organs the members in general meeting and the board of directors. And in some instances, you could argue that the MD, managing director, could also be a, an organ of the company. But that is not compulsory <coughs> because companies mustn't appoint managing directors. So it's not a compulsory. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so these are the two organs of meetings. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Yes, and so from time to time, these persons are required to come together to vote. We emphasize also that between these two organs, the board of directors are conferred with the power to manage the affairs of the company. So by default, by default, managerial responsibility and powers are conferred upon the members of the board and in carrying out their responsibilities, they are not mandated to comply with the directives of the members in general meeting, provided they are acting with due diligence and in good faith. We also emphasize that uh, 
arguably we could say that the members in general meeting have the ultimate power of control over the company because among other things they can sack <coughs> the directors among other things they can sack the directors but how to uh, how to exercise their powers in practice is not always easy that is why functionally and practically speaking you could argue that the board of directors is even the most superior organ are you with me yes. but theoretically speaking if you look at just the provisions of the law the members in general meeting are the ultimate uh, they have the ultimate authority so <clears throat> some of the things we want to look at some of the learning outcomes we will get from this lecture is number one we will look at a matter such as notices notices of meetings who may attend meetings Consequences for of the consequence of failure to hold meetings where required. We will look at quorum. Quorum will look at disruptions, adjournments, voting, resolutions, proxies, the law relating to proxies. We will look at the power of the chairman over the meeting. We will look at the power of the chairman over the meeting, among uh, other things. <coughs> Just again, still a lean background to emphasize that companies have to decide from time to time. Decisions have to be made by companies. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes, and these decisions can be inserted in the articles. Some of the decisions of the company can be inserted in the articles or in a contract or in a contract but usually, usually they are arrived at through <coughs> votings at meetings. Are you with me? Yes, so some decisions of the company can be inserted in the articles. Some of them can be uh, inserted in the contract. But usually decisions of the company are arrived at through resolutions or votings at meetings. But not every decision of the members uh, must be taken at meetings. So as we continue, you will discover that for private companies, the law allows them to also take decisions, allows the members to take decisions without necessarily calling for mm -hmm. a meeting. Why meetings? Why meetings? Why meetings? First of all is the issue of corporate democracy. Corporate democracy. <clears throat> Why meetings? First thing that wants to come to your mind is uh, corporate democracy. The company, as we continue our study, you will discover that the company has several stakeholders. Several stakeholders that come together to you know, uh, interact around this entity. You know, the primary stakeholders, of course, are the members. Then you can now start talking about employees. Please come in. <clears throat> you can now start talking about uh, employees. And then you can look at other stakeholders, such as the directors. And then the company has borrowed money. The company has borrowed money. You will now look at the creditors as well. Are you with me? Are you with me? And uh, from time to time, company law requires that these stakeholders may need to meet and take certain decisions, either because the powers to carry out a particular thing has been conferred on them, or either because a particular matter affects them directly. So for example, if you want to reduce the, you want to vary the right of creditors, that is something that affects them directly. Are you with me? And so company law provides that you must allow them to take that decision. Or if we have issued <coughs> classes of shares, I talk about types of shares in this class. Did I talk about that? Yes, did I talk about that? Yes. Example, a company may issue ordinary share. No, before I come to ordinary share, a company may issue what? Preferred shares or what else? Different shares, or what else? Preference shares, yes, ordinary shares. <coughs> yes, so a company may, yes, a company may issue ordinary shares, 
deferred shares or preference shares. And I also pointed out that even amongst these ordinary shares, we could have what? Classes of shares. So we could have class A ordinary shares, class B ordinary shares, and class C ordinary shares. Blessing, were you there when I taught that topic? Good. And I pointed out that what differentiates class A from class B and class B from class C are the rights vested in the holders of those classes. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And so we may provide that the ordinary shareholders in class A will have the right to appoint the chief financial officer of the company. If they have that right, then all those shareholders together can be lumped into a class. Please come in. And then we could now have class B shareholders and class... These are all ordinary shares. What is the core element of an ordinary share, Brian? Yes, my daughter. You know when I've known your name, you're in trouble. Quickly, help us. What is the core feature of the ordinary share? I hope you dress well before I come to my class, because when I put this in on YouTube, if you don't dress well now... I think you're hearing a Sufi's voice in the class. Yes. Uh -huh. he, has, he has passed on, but his voice is still living. That is how, if you like, don't dress well when you go to my class. I will show this video to your children. <laughs> Look at your father. Brian, my daughter, you can continue. If you have forgotten, no, Ahala, you can just sit down. Okay, it's an equity investment, yes. But what, what I'm trying to look at, sit down, my daughter. The main thing I'm looking out for is the fact that an ordinary shareholder does not have any special entitlements. Are you with me? Ensure that it is okay. Particularly with respect to income. He does not have any special entitlements. He rises and falls with what? The company. The company. But even as he doesn't have any special rights, he also does not have any cap on the extent to which he can share in profits. Blessing, are you with me? Mm -hmm. He rises and falls with the company. So whenever the company is rising, he's rising. He doesn't have any stipulated agreement in advance that if we make one billion naira, you can't go above, we can't give you more than 100 million. Do you agree? Yeah. If he does that, then it's not an ordinary share. You can call it any other thing, but definitely not an ordinary share. An ordinary shareholder is the purest form of equity because he has no special rights, neither does he have any special caps or limitations. Are you with me? Whenever profits are declared, he shares. If there are losses, he suffers with the company. If profits are not declared for the next 10 years, he has nothing. He cannot sue the company, he cannot complain, provided there's no... Uh, uh, mago mago, no fraud or malice behind the non declaration of uh, profits. Are you with me? So, just to point out that I said all of that to say this that <clears throat> company law requires meetings to be held from time to time by special groups, special stakeholders. And so, if I am a class A ordinary shareholder and uh, the terms of issue of those shares provide that those shareholders together will have the authority to appoint the chief, the managing director of the company, as the case may be, or to approve certain transactions above certain limits, whatever rights that are uh, made available to them. If for any reason we are going to vary those rights, company law requires that those members who are now specially affected must have a say. Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, I'm emphasizing the fact that stakeholders that are associated with the company are allowed from time to time to take crucial decisions as it pertains to their interests. And so as a result of that, the law of meetings is not synonymous with meetings of members. The law of meetings is broad because it embraces meetings of the venture holders on the one hand. It embraces meetings of creditors. Please understand where I'm going to. Creditors is used in a wider sense here. Are you with me? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. 
<coughs> meetings of creditors. So here we are talking of all the creditors, whether the bench holders, unsecured, secured, whatever, all creditors from time to time, as the case may be, may be required to have meetings. So for example, if a company is now insolvent and it is now going into what they call administration, we'll look at that in second semester. An insolvency practitioner has now been appointed, the directors are displaced, and they say, Oga, see how you can rescue this company as a going concern, instead of us dissolving it. That man will require the members to have meetings, but more importantly, he will require the creditors to meet. They will have what they call ICM, an ICM, initial creditors meeting, and from time to time, when necessary, they will have meetings. Here we are not looking at meetings of the bench holders. Here we are looking of, at meetings of what? Creditors. But in other instances, we looked at the bench holders last and before we went for the holidays. Is that also? If we have issued multiple debentures, multiple debentures, usually when we issue debentures to multiple group of persons, we emphasize that a person, a single person will be appointed to protect their interests. What is that person called? Eh? A trustee. Is that also? A trustee. And then there will be a, a document to be signed. Uh, a deed or something, a, a, a deed. Eh? Good. You know, my, my brain, you know, we have so much. A debenture trust deed will be signed and all that. From time to time, debenture holders may be also required to meet. Are you with me? If a company is being liquidated on the ground of insolvency, and let's assume it has 10 shareholders, four of them are fully paid for their shares. Those who have paid will not be liable to the liquidator because they will be entitled to the protection of limited liability. Is that not so? Yes, yes we are looking at limited liability companies. But the other six that have not paid for their shares will be liable to contribute. And we looked at that when we dealt with membership, section 117. Go back and look at it. The liquidator is going to now get the books of the company get the register of members, know how many shareholders have not paid for their shares, and he is going to begin to deal with them. Those persons are debtors to the company. During insolvent liquidation, two core stakeholders are involved. On the one hand, we have the creditors who are looking at recouping their money. On the other hand, we have these shareholders who have not paid for their shares. They are called contributories. Are you with me? Contributories because they are liable to contribute to the company's asset pool until creditors are satisfied. And so from time to time again, these contributories may be required to hold what meetings. I emphasize the fact that companies must appoint directors, and with the exception of, the Karma 2020 has made some uh, amendments to the law of directors, you will look at uh, I've written, how many of you have read even my articles that I've been giving you people? <laughs> you have not read those articles. I will send them again for purpose of emphasis. Go and read them. <coughs> Two of your questions will come from the articles out of the five. So if you don't read them, then you will be having, uh, let's assume we're giving you six questions to answer for. Two of them I will bring from articles. So have, in this article, Dr. Subai said they discuss. If you like, don't read. You will now have four to answer four. Are you with me? Omemo, are you with me? Because you did not read those two now. You have narrowed your options. Is that not so? Good. <laughs> the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I was trying to say something. That uh, before, no, directors, before this time, every company must appoint two directors, and directors must act as a board. Kama 2020, in, in order to make corporate administration flexible for smaller companies, now provides that a small company and a, an SMC, a single member company, need not have more than one director. And so if we have only one director, we cannot be talking about board meeting anymore. Is that not so? Yes. Yes. But for every other company, so every other company, we are looking at large private companies and what? 
And what? Public companies. They must appoint directors, at least two. And directors must act collectively as a board. So company law requires that from time to time, the directors may need to meet. They don't have to meet. It's not compulsory, as you will see. But they may need to meet. And if they choose to meet, we have certain procedures they must comply with. And just laying foundation before, because our focus more in this topic will be meetings of members. Are you with me? Yes, but most of the principles applicable to meetings of members will also apply to uh, <clears throat> other meetings of stakeholders as well. You know, so, uh, okay, 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 so, why meetings? I said meetings and corporate democracy because meetings are the only avenues through which the principles of corporate democracy can be brought to bear and uh, they are an integral part of what we call the stakeholder theory of corporate governance that various stakeholders should be involved in the company and uh, all that. So now, let's, now let's look briefly at the importance of meetings. We'll just run through this. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. I want to thank all of you that wished me happy, uh, happy Christmas. And uh, please come in. Welcome, sir. Happy Christmas. Happy New Year. May God also make your New Year happy in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who forgot, but it was in your heart, may God also make your New Year happy in Jesus' name. Yeah. For those, those of you that did not remember, it was not your heart, may God put it in your heart in Jesus' name. Yeah. You have to start to, you know, learn to appreciate people. And appreciation does not have to do with money. You know, in our country is so corrupt that when you, when you talk of appreciation, what people think of is money. Is that not so? Yes. But it can just be a, a message. You have a pastor that has been a blessing to you. I send him a message. Say, Thank you, sir, for all the messages you have been sharing for us this year. I appreciate you. I have been mightily blessed. It's just enough. You know, learn to thank people. Learn to give back. And then uh, you just discover that you'll be happy. Okay, let's... Come back. Some of you even went beyond the call of duty to extend yourselves. God will remember you. Amen. I said, God will remember you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we come back to the importance of meetings. And I, I've already emphasized number one is that meetings give to members the ultimate power of control. I don't need to emphasize that again. Number two, meetings, particularly meetings of members now, we are now focusing on meetings of members. Uh, a, they, 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 they are a platform for corporate accountability. Corporate accountability. One of the ways you will know that a person is even accountable is that he calls for meetings regularly. A bad leader doesn't want to call for meetings. And if he calls for those meetings, he will apply what they call sharp practices. Before the meeting, he has already called a group of persons and he has told them what he wants to do. Then he does some funny things. So for example now, and it's, it's worse in Nigeria because we are, many people are indisciplined. So if we are all lost now, are you with me? Mm -hmm. I want to take one kind of decision. I know that Umemu is likely to object. And Naomi may object. So I'll just fix the meeting for nine. Nine o'clock. And I will tell, once he's, Two seconds past nine, lock the door. Are you with me? Lock the door. And I will have told those my persons, this is what we are going to do in that meeting. We will appoint the lesser chief judge quickly. So everybody, all those people who are part of the coup, they will be there by 8.50. Nine o'clock, they have entered. Lock the door. Do you agree for this? Yes, yes, they just vote. They, are, they, are, they are will be locking the door, locking the door. There's nothing they can do. They came, what? They yes. came. It's not good to go later. Yes. It's good to be at the right place at the right, right time. time. The man of God shares something <coughs> with us. His father, his father was in the village, village boy, who ended up as a professor of law, of engineering, physics. 
and he schooled at Princeton University. Princeton is one of the top universities in the world. And he said something that when they were young, they had his classmates who was the most intelligent among all of them. His brain is in the clouds. But there was a day when some people came to the village to give scholarship. He was not there. And so they gave all the rest of them scholarships. He missed it. Forty years later, he was still a cocoa farmer. Cutting mm -hmm. cocoa in the village. He missed his opportunity. And some people have just one opportunity in life. People like us will have many. <laughs> but some of you may not have many. You just have one. Once you miss it, you may never recover. That is why those of you who have gained admission to study law uh, and you are playing with it. Thank God you have reached your final year. But some people are playing with this opportunity that God has given them. We don't know where they are. Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I had a classmate. We were all in the U.S. studying law. He went to copy in the hall. Normal copy, just the way, ah, just normal copy. <laughs> Somebody say normal copy. Normal. You know, there's normal copy and then there's <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> copy. <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> copy is like you bring somebody into the hall to write for you. I don't even understand. The normal copy is that you just went in with something. <laughs> <laughs> but for a lot of you, that is normal. So... He came in and they were just doing normal copying, five or six of them. Unfortunately, one of my lecturers caught them. They went through disciplinary process and they gave them one year suspension. Do you know he never came back? He could never return. He had lost what you call his Kairos moment. Small opportunity that God gave him to lift him out of poverty. He never returned. One year later, you don't know that your opportunity to study law is your opportunity to escape from poverty. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> You'd be joking with your course. One year later, when he came back after his suspension, he could not find his file. <laughs> he began to move from uh, headquarters of his school to law faculty two years. Where are your documents? Where this? You know it can happen. Yes. yes. Three years. He never finished with us. He never went back. Fast forward, many years later, I came here to lecture. He was a student here, studying. I will not name the call the name of the course. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some courses that uh -huh, studying one of those courses. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He was studying one of those courses. I was a lecturer. He was a student. You know, so we have to know that. So accountability, can I come back to company law? Yes. Yes. Good people, good lecturer. So meetings give us a platform to hold leadership to what? Account. So it is at such meetings that a leader must now give account of his stewardship. How, you, how have you managed this company for the past one year? What, have, what has been happening? What has arisen and all that? So people can now ask questions and hold you to account. And like, like I said, if you want to be funny, then you will not want to call meetings at all. Number two, number three, meetings also give us opportunity for clarification. 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 Number, number four, appointments. Appointments. As you will discover in the course of our study, there are certain appointments that can only be made at meetings. Appointments. Number five, approvals and ratifications. Approvals and ratifications. Thank you, Lord. Can you look up, please? So, in its, in its wisdom, and in a bid to have a balance of power between the board and the members, <coughs> company law has provided that certain decisions that are taken by the board of directors must be ratified by the members. So no matter you look down on the members as directors, you have to go back to them to obtain their approval. As an example is if you appoint somebody as a casual director, so 
in the course of the year, Director A had calls to relocate to Germany. And we, we filled that vacuum quickly with this young lady, Blessing. So Blessing has been a director for the past six months. Now we will need the members to do what? To do what? To ratify. So approvals and ratification. Approvals and ratification. Another example is a pre-incorporation contract. Remind me to talk about promoters and pre-incorporation contracts before we finish this class. I have not talked on it, but just 10, 15 minutes. I should say, say it should not be done. Not take more than that. Approvals and ratification. So another example are uh, pre-incorporation contracts. So if a company, before it was incorporated, had entered into a contract with this, my daughter, your name again? Denya. Denya, and said, okay, Denya, upon incorporation, uh, is it D-I-G-H-A? Yes. And Denya, okay. Upon incorporation, we are going to uh, give you this, 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 this. I mean, that is a, a pre-incorporation contract. It's not usually meant to bind the company. But upon incorporation, the members will have to approve it. Are you with me? Yes, yeah, so approvals and ratifications. So another, another thing we do at meetings are removals. 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 You can remove the secretary or approve the removal of the secretary, as the case may be. And we could remove directors, we could remove auditors, and all that. <clears throat> Another one is disclosures, 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 disclosures. Meetings, the law provides that, again, in a bid to checkmate the directors, the law provides that certain courses of action that they take cannot have validity unless, first of all, they make full what? Disclosure. Full disclosure to the members in general meeting. You know, so for example, the age of a director, the age of directors that are above uh, 70 for public companies, there should be disclosures. And then uh, if you are going to compensate a manager or director and enter into a contract with him beyond five years, the law provides that you must disclose a number of them. You will see that when you get my book. My book is almost done and it's almost out. What I want some of you to do for me I've already talked with my publisher. I want to go to the, to the publishing house this month, in Jesus' name. Amen. But I will, I will reach out to a number of you. The book has 23 chapters, 200,000 words, so it's voluminous. I don't write until I don't tire. <laughs> Back pain, neck pain. I wrote until water has stopped coming out from my eye. Water, now, water does not come out from my eyes because I've stared at the computer for hours on end. 15 hours, 18 hours, 15 hours, 18 hours. You know, but what I want you to do now for me, some of you, I'll reach out to some of you. I will give you chapters of the book to read. So I can say, remember oh, my daughter, go through chapter one. Does it make sense? Is there a flow? Because I'm writing it for students. Are you with me? Are you with me? So the students that I'm writing it for must understand. So I will call my brother Palimote. Okay, Oga, look at chapter three. The good thing is that most of the chapters you are looking at, it's like you are reading for your exam. I don't know if you understand. Yes. Yeah. So I will reach out to. But when I give you the material, don't photocopy, don't share. Because that is how. <laughs> Just read it. Make your points. Uh, this one is a little bit too abstract. Blah, blah, blah. Then uh, I want I will do that this week before I finally go back to my publisher. And those of you that I will give, I will acknowledge your name in the acknowledge your name will go over the world. Oh. <laughs> Can I continue? Good. So meetings are very important. Again, just to emphasize that for purpose of corporate flexibility, you cannot call for meetings to address every matter. That is why company law now says, by default, directors should manage the company. I don't even understand. Yes. yes, so they have the right to manage and to take decisions. And the decisions of the director acting as a board is directly attributed to the company. Because if for every, every issue, you have to call a meeting. You have to call a meeting. Then we'll be in problem. One, meetings are very expensive. Very expensive. To call and hold a meeting is expensive. You have to rent a hall. 
you have to issue notices and then a lot of other things. If it's a public company, you have to go to the newspaper. Are you with me? Yes, Make yes. publications and all that. You provide refreshment and all that. So what company law now does is to allow the members to delegate all these powers to the directors. Go and just take decisions. Go and act on our behalf and all that. However, however, there are some matters that cannot be what delegated. I'll run through some of them because I was just asking the exam and directors have powers to manage and all that, blah, blah, blah. However, they may not, uh, they may not delegate certain, I mean, certain, certain decisions cannot be delegated to them. Can you list five of them? That should tell me number one. For example is, example is variation of class rights, variation of class rights cannot be delegated. Ratification and approvals, example, reincorporation contracts. Can we continue, please? Pause it, pause it, please. Now, so I was trying to say some matters cannot be what? Delegated. Okay, so example are uh, matters requiring uh, ratifications and approvals. Uh, yes, alterations of the memorandum and association uh, articles. Those matters you cannot delegate. You cannot say to your directors, go and then uh, alter the memorandum as you understand. Yes, section 137. And that 137 addressing issues on serious loss of capital. We'll talk about it. If there's serious loss of capital uh, for a public company, they must call a meeting. The directors cannot take that decision. That's what we are trying to say. Mm. Yeah, substantial property transactions. Substantial property transactions. If a company has to do a substantial property transaction with its director, you cannot delegate the right to approve that transaction to the directors. You must call for meetings. You must call for meetings. You must call for meetings. If you want to remove the secretary of a public company, if you want to remove the secretary of a public company on a ground other than fraud, on a ground other than fraud. He did not steal, he just that he's always sleeping at meetings and you want to sack him and uh, all that, you must, you must bring it to the members in general meeting. Are you with me? Are you with me so far? Yes. Good. So just, just, as you come, as you continue to read, you will see a number of them. I'm still laying foundation though. Are you with me? I'm laying foundation so that you have a grasp of the uh, principles. So those are matters that uh, cannot be delegated. They must be uh, they must be handled only by at meetings of members, at meetings of members. Again, uh, closely related to that are, closely related to that are matters that can only be handled by meetings or at meetings. Matters that can only be handled by meetings or at meetings. Example, receiving of financial statement. You see all that in my slide. That should be slide eight. Appointment of auditors, removal of directors under the default procedure, appointments, uh, I mean, uh, reports and right to information, director of report and auditor's report, you must table them before the meetings. Approval of dividends recommended by the board, measures and acquisitions, winding up, those are all decisions that you can only handle at a uh, meeting. Now again, just to emphasize, please look up again, just to emphasize that you must differentiate meetings. Remember, are you with me? Are you with me? You must differentiate a decision arrived at at a meeting from a decision of all the members. They are not the same thing. You should call a meeting and take the decision at a meeting. That's what the law says. You know, so if we are calling, if the company has 100 members, 
and you call for a meeting, you may issue a valid notice of meeting. Only eight people attend, provided they constitute a quorum and they take a decision. It is valid in law. But if the 100 members meet in a beer parlor and take a decision, it is not valid. Go to, are you with me? Uh, for Cardos, are you with me? Yes, sir. Good. So the law says that we have entered into a substantial property transaction with our director. A substantial property tra transaction is that we are buying something from our director. Normally, a director, because he's a fiduciary, ought not to sell his assets to the company or vice versa. You know why now? Do you know why? My daughter, you know why? Eh? It will result in conflict of interest. So it is prohibited. However, in some instances, we may allow. If we enter into a substantial property transaction with a director, it has to be approved, are you with me, by the members in a general ward meeting. And if we have 100 members, and we call for that meeting, and only eight people attend, and they form a quorum, and they approve, it's valid. But if those 100 members of the company, that's what I'm saying, they meet in blessings, wedding, and reception, say amen. amen. You go, are you married already? Yes. You will marry in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So they now meet at a wedding reception, a hundred of them. As the meeting is going on, and say there's a serious matter we need to address. Thank God we are all here. Let's go to the back. And they go say, actually, we entered into a substantial property transaction with a director in Nango. Can we have, oh, we all approve. In Nango is a good woman. Oh, why they discuss with us about that matter? We all approve. It is not valid because there was no meeting known to law. Eh? You don't understand it. Okay, Palimote, help this young lady. Let me draw some more breaths. Explain to her what I just said. That's what I say is that the meeting is supposed to be on formal basis. Yes. Um, because 100 persons who are directors was opportunity to gather in a particular place where it was not officially done mm -hmm. and they rectified just an idea or just a transaction. It is not valid because the purpose of them going to that particular occasion was not for the purpose of rectifying the transaction that has taken place in relation to the business. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I don't know if you understand. Yeah. So, even if there are just eight people that came to the meeting and they take a decision, that decision of the eight people has more weight in law. The law, in its wisdom, does not mandate members to attend. It is a moral duty to attend meetings, but it's not a legal duty. Just like it's a moral duty now for us to vote. How many of us have got your PVCs? I have gone, I've registered, I have to go and pick my own today or tomorrow. We should all vote. Because you don't vote and you are praying and crying to God for change. You are just wasting your time. Let's all vote. But for us in Nigeria, it's not yet a legal duty. It's possible that at some point it could be a legal duty where if you don't vote, you will not be entitled to certain rights. But for now, it's not. So it's a moral duty. I don't know if you understand. Yeah. It's a moral duty. I was talking with him in away yeah, yesterday, and he said he, he has not gone to the village for some time. Ayama, was for this election, he is, he is going to vote. That is a moral duty that we all have. So that same concept is brought to company law, where members don't have to vote. Among other things, they are not fiduciaries anyway. But, and they don't have to attend meetings. And so, if only eight people come and they form a quorum, the law is okay with that. Are you with me? Yes, All you now need to do is to ensure that that decision, the required majority, we'll look at different majorities, was attained. Was it an ordinary resolution? Was it a special resolution? As the case may be. In the course of your study, therefore, you will continue to see certain scenarios. I'm laying foundation and I want you to follow me you begin to see certain scenarios play out as you read karma and you read company law. Some decisions the law will require all the members. Somebody say all the members. All all the members. members. In other instances, the law will require all the members in a meeting. 
They are not the same thing. So all the members in the meeting simply means we have 100 members, only eight people came. The eight of them must approve unanimous consent of all the members that attended. In the other instance, Oga, you must get the unanimous consent of everybody. Where the law requires unanimous consent of all the members, it usually does not provide all the members in a meeting. Ask me why. Mm. It will be virtually impossible to get all the members to attend a meeting. And so in that instance, the law will allow the members to sign a form of what? Assent. Are you with me? So we have eight members attending the meeting, and they all approve. We still have 92 that did not come. And to carry out this decision, we need all their consent. So the law now allows us to take a document to them, <coughs> and everybody must now sign. So that is a corporate decision that wasn't taken at a meeting, but has the validity as though it was. Draw that distinction. <coughs> Are there questions? Are there questions? Mago, there any question? Is it clear so far? Okay, so I think we can now jump into. Yes, now let's look at right to attend meetings. Who may attend meetings? Mm, in attendance. We want to see that in section 243. 243 of camera. So we are now beginning to jump into meetings of members. <coughs> meetings of members. And uh, for meetings of members, or uh, what it's what they heard here as meetings and proceedings of companies, you will find that in chapter 10. Please notice chapter 10 of Kama, of part B of of course of Kama, and those are in sections 235, 235 to what 268, 235 to 268. Yes, my dear. So you made a mistake while you were calling out the provisions. Okay. So you write to attend meetings. Is there 243? 243. Okay. So it's 107. No, no, I'll, I'll come to 107. I, I am aware of that. Can we continue? Can we continue, my, my good people? Yes, sir. Okay, so write to attend meetings. Now, in looking at, please look up. In looking at the right to attend meetings, you have to look out two, there are two distinct things. You are coming late to Oga. If they come late, you just be doing like a big man. It's not good now. What you are doing, is it good? Eh? Is it good? Is it good? Eh, it's okay, sit down. Don't do it again, eh? Now you must distinguish between, please look up. You must distinguish between the rights of members to attend meetings and the rights of other persons. So for purpose of meetings of members, although the meeting is going to be held by members, company law envisages or provides that other relevant stakeholders must also attend that meeting. Okay, Parliament, tell you with me. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. So first of all, we have the members, but the auditors must also be there. They have the right. Directors must also be there. Secretary must also be there. The uh, for the Karma 2020 now says CAC must also be there as well. So you see all that in section 243. 243. For the primary persons that must attend these meetings are the who members. members. So that's where you now look at section 107. But note the proviso in section 107 that the articles may provide. That the member to whom shares have been issued, who doesn't pay for those shares after calls are duly made upon him, may be disentitled from attending and voting. If the articles don't provide like that, then you cannot, you must attend. So it's not automatic. So if I ask you in the exam now, 
uh, uh, member shareholder ABC have not paid for their shares and so they were not issued notice of meetings. You should know that that is wrong. They were not issued notice of meetings and they were not allowed to attend the meeting because they had not paid for the shares and the articles provided that if they have not paid for the shares, after calls are duly made on them, then they won't attend. Now you're on short footing. So try and draw that distinction. Are you clear so far, my daughter? Yes, That's my daughter. Are you clear now? Good. So we want to see all that in sections 107, 251, 252, 243 as well. So these are the persons who may attend meeting number one, every member. Somebody say every member. Every member. Good. But the interesting thing now is that you cannot look up again. Remember I told you that shareholding is not synonymous with membership. Why is that so? They are, why is that so? Because some companies are not share capital companies. Nice one. But we are now looking at a share capital company. A share capital company. Your shareholding does not automatically make you a member. Why? Oh, if your name is not listed on the... Okay. They has explained. Okay, you hear that? Did you hear the lady? Oh yeah, come and sit here. <coughs> I will not go to heaven alone. I will carry some people with us. Are you hearing me? If I have to hold their hand, I will hold them. This is one of such persons. Sit down here with us. They are, say what you just said. Please, I'll listen to her. If your name is not listed on the list of names, um, register. 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 Yes. You are not entitled to the rights of what? Membership. Very important. So if I transfer my shares to Umemu, and her name hasn't yet been entered into the register. If the company is to call a meeting, they will call me. They don't know her. Or they are processing, you know, putting her name on the register. Until that is done, she is not entitled. But company law still, in its wisdom, recognizes, please listen, recognizes that in certain instances, the shares may have devolved on a person shares of a member may have devolved on another person under in other certain circumstances, one of which could be in the event of death. Yeah, we're not looking at transfer now. Mr. A has died. He left a will. In the will, he appointed Mr. B as the executor. Automatically, once that executor is able to probate the will, probate, probate means proof. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes. Once he probates the will, automatically the law recognizes him as the personal representative of the deceased Mr. A. And so his shares, the shares of Mr. A, automatically devolve on the who executor. Who may not want his name to be entered into the register of members? Do you know why? Because the, the, the executorship is a process. The end of that process is to look for the beneficiaries of the will and ultimately allot the shares to them. So the man has 10 children and he has 10 shares in UBA and he has died. The executor, first of all, has probated the will. Having probated the will, his role now is to administer the estate of this dead man one of which is to bring these shares and share among the children. All that can take two years. Is that so? Is that so? Yes. All through this period, until he is done with this part of the administration, the law recognizes him as the personal representative. So the shares have devolved upon him by virtue of that. He must be called to meetings, section 243. Okay, I hope it's clear. Excellent. You must be called to meeting. The alternative to a person dying, a person who dies can either die testate or what? Yes. If he dies in testate, how is his estate administered? That's my son, yes. What is your name? Yes, you? Manuel. Yes, how is his estate administered? Yes, he died without a will. Yes. 
customary law. Uh, in John Native Law and Custom. You may have an idea. Frankly, help us. Frankly, I hope you are not reading something. It's like you are doing something. Frankly, help us. Hmm? It's not just to be fine, though. I'll be cutting your hair. I'm telling you now. <laughs> Sit down. Uh -huh, that's my beautiful daughter, the girl behind Brian. Help us. It's not just to be fine, though. Help us. No. No. See, what happens is that, just look up. I, I thought you have done land law now. And some form of equity and trust. Yes. When a person dies, <laughs> when a person dies, if his property is held under English law, are you with me? Mm -hmm. That property usually can be administered under two instances. If he dies, if he leaves a will, then we will appoint he in the will. We have the wisdom to appoint somebody mm -hmm. as an executor. Mm -hmm. He could make a will and not appoint anybody. Mm -hmm. He made a will. The will should have an executor, somebody that he trusts, maybe his pastor, an impartial person with integrity. He will appoint that person to execute the will. If he doesn't, when we probate the will, we'll have to go to the courts, the, the legal system, and appoint somebody to administer the estates. So you could either have a testator, I mean an executor, or an administrator, what you call estate administrator. These are the two basic means. If he doesn't leave a will, then the law on the administration of estates will govern how that property is to be shared. So if he has three children of full blood, he will share it among them. If he doesn't have any child, but he has a brother, he has two brothers. One is half brother. Almost all of us have half brothers. <laughs> but in our own generation, it will not be so in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, so you now, you now have two brothers. Please look up. Two brothers. One is of full blood. Full, full blood means that that person sucked the same breast with you. The same mama, the same papa. papa. Half blood means that your father, when he went to worry <laughs> for, for, for short course assignments, he met one Sapele woman and then <laughs> the child came. <laughs> That is a half, a step brother. Are you with me? Yes. The administration of estate law will say that if this man dies, his brother of half blood will not take a dime. Yes. <coughs> the assets will go, to, if, he, if he doesn't have a child or a wife, then it will go to his brother or brothers or siblings or full what? Blood. Blood. And all that. It is if he doesn't have any brother of full blood, so you keep descending. I don't know if you understand me. Yeah. You keep descending, you keep descending. And so it's always more tidy to leave a will because in your will you can say, that's my half-brother, he's very wonderful, and Papa gave birth to him when we were already grew, grown up. I want to provide for him and all that. So these are the two main ways you administer this estate. Number one is the administrator who is appointed through a court system. You, what happens is that the person goes to the court and says, I am the younger brother to this man who died. I'm applying to administer his estate. They will do an advert on the newspaper, 21 days. Are you with me? If there's no objection, he will be appointed. Either way, this administrator or this executor is called a personal what? A personal what? Representative. You should pay for this one, though. That's not company law. So what Kama is saying here, please look up. Who is entitled to attend meetings? I said all of that to say the number one, a member. Number two, assuming that member has fallen into some kind of circumstances, then we now have to cater for certain other persons that may have come into possession of his interest. The first of whom is a personal word representative, which could be either an executor or a administrator. Good. The next one is a receiver, a receiver, a receiver. Please look up again. Look up again. Henry, are you with me? Good man. Look up again. This is company ABC. 
You know a company can be a member of another company. Yeah. You know that? Yeah. Good. Pupere, how are you? How many times have I called your name? Welcome. God bless you. <laughs> now, this is company ABC Nigeria Limited. Listen, oh, it is insolvent. It has problems. It has borrowed money from my daughter, Mata, and is unable to pay. We've done the bench of that. I don't need to explain this one again. And so, Mata will appoint a receiver if the money was uh, collateralized, if the money was secured. Is that not so? And she will appoint a receiver or a receiver manager. manager. When do we appoint a receiver manager? My daughter. Where is Patani? Patani is not here. Glory. Yes. Patani, you are here. Uh, Glory, help us. When will you appoint a receiver manager? And when will you appoint just a receiver? Don't worry, it will come back. It will come back. I know you know it. Sit down, my daughter. Patani, help us. Can somebody help them? Help. A very simple thing. Can somebody help? Yes, my dear blessing. Uh, he appoints a receiving manager when the floating charge is. Uh, when just when it is a floating charge. Okay. When do you appoint a receiver? We uh, when it's a fixed charge. Yes. Yeah, so please look up. Look up. Remember, I told you about the floating charge. There is a creation of equity that gives to the company the liberty to trade with those assets even when it has borrowed money from somebody. And I told you that it's a win-win situation for the creditor and for the company because the company has the liberty to trade and then the creditor, on the other hand, does not have to be limited to just one asset. Are you with me? Yes. The problem is that if the company becomes insolvent for the receiver, for the floating charge holder, the law allows him to take control of the company because usually what you use to secure the money is a floating charge over all your assets as well as your undertaking, present and future, book debt, everything. And so the moment you default on your obligations to the creditor, he doesn't just appoint a receiver to receive an asset because he cannot identify a particular asset. Instead, you appoint this man to receive and do what? <coughs> Manage. And so he enters into the premises, tells the directors to go and rest. He begins to manage the company. At the same time, he's getting the money to pay the creditor. The fixed charge, on the other hand, is different because here we have an identifiable asset. Are you with me? Yes, yeah, so we have secured the money with this laptop. The moment there is a default, you don't need to come and manage or take charge of the company. Your role is to come after these assets. So you appoint a receiver. And now company law is saying to us here, under section 243, please listen. Who can attend a meeting? Number one, member. Number two, any person upon whom the ownership of shares have devolved by virtue of A, being a personal representative, I've explained that. Two, by virtue of being a receiver being a receiver. So the receiver, the moment he comes in into the company, what he now does is to begin to look for all the assets of the company. He begins to look for the assets of the company. Please, listen, you know, my son, close that laptop. Good man. He begins to look for all the assets of who? The company. And so if the company has shares in, the insolvent company has shares in UBA Nigeria Limited, automatically this receiver that has been appointed he will have a right to be notified of uh, meetings. Thirdly, please listen. Thirdly, a person upon whom the shares are devolved upon by virtue of being a trustee in bankruptcy. Trustee in bankruptcy is a bit similar to receivership, but here you are looking at a person. Receivership, you are usually looking at a what? A what? A company. If you are bankrupt, 
unable to pay your creditors, you may seek protection under the bankruptcy proceedings. My Lord, I'm bankrupt. One of the things the law will do is to appoint a trustee, a trustee in bankruptcy. That person will now go after all your assets. All the money you have anywhere is rolled out to pursue those funds. Are you with me? Yes. And to begin to pay your creditors more small. You may not pay them everything, but at least let them get something. That trustee in bankruptcy is the person now that will be notified of these uh, meetings. Are there questions, please? I've used almost 20 minutes to explain this. Yes? For that, the CEO is different. The CEO is a director. The com that, in that case, the company is still a going concern. The receivership comes in when the company is insolvent, it cannot pay its creditors, and those creditors have now moved. It, it could be done by the courts upon the application of the creditors, and then it could be done by a floating charge holder. If the debenture provides that you can make the appointment. If it doesn't provide, then it's not an automatic rise, in which case you have to go to the court. I've told all directors, auditors, and the secretary of the company may also um, do what? Have the right to attend. attend. Good people, good lecturer. Now, now let's jump in fully. And yes, my daughter. Sir, so, are these um, personal representatives and this receiver, are they different from the proxy? Totally different. Totally different. Proxy, thank you for that. We'll come to it soon. But a proxy is appointed where I cannot go to the meeting because my daughter is getting married. And all the things I'm saying are good, good things. Yes. And I'm not saying I'm going to bury somebody. My daughter <laughs> is married. And I said, this, my son, what's your name? Kingsley, please go and represent me as the case may be. So now let's just run through the types of meetings you listen to that in the audio. We have the first, what is it? Statutory meeting. The second? Yeah, EGM. And then the third is the EGM. Okay. Yes, extraordinary. So I will take them again. Why I'm taking them? Because I'm going to upload this on YouTube. And I'll bring down the other video. I want a more detailed uh, lecture. So let's just assume that you have not known it. And now we want to start afresh. So, the statutory meeting is a once-in-a-lifetime meeting for newly incorporated public companies. It must be held within six months after incorporation or formation. Failure to call and hold that meeting is a ground to wind up the company. At that meeting, what the directors are to basically do is to table a document before the members call the statutory reports. Statutory report. Just to emphasize again that in the past, in the United Kingdom and also in Nigeria, a newly incorporated public company could not commence business until it obtained a trading certificate. A trading certificate. That requirement has been removed, but for a newly incorporated public company, they must now have what they call a statutory meeting. You know, so basically what they consider are pre-incorporation matters and post-incorporation matters. So before we incorporated the company and after we incorporated the past six months, we've been able to appoint a secretary, we have employed this number of staff, this is the direction we're taking. Are you with me? You table before the members the basic information about uh, what you have been doing so far. And that report must be certified as true by the... Uh, auditor of the company. So the statutory meeting must be held in Nigeria and uh, <clears throat> it must be held <coughs> yeah, it must be held in Nigeria and there's something else I wanted to point out. Okay. So you, you see all that in section 253, 253 of Kama. Take your time and look at some of the details or the contents of the report. I'll just run through them. Among other things, you will consider the number of shares that you have allotted since incorporation and the amount of money you have received as consideration for them, the details of the company's officers and auditor, 
pre-incorporation contracts and proposed modifications to them, information on, the, on underwriting contracts that have not been carried out, the reasons why they have not been carried out, and particulars of commissions or brokerage paid or to be paid in connection with the issue of shares or debentures to any director or to the manager, an abstract of the receipts of the company and of the payments made from them up to a date within seven days of the date of the report exhibiting under distinctive against the receipts of the company's shares and all that. And just again to emphasize that the court may extend the time for the holding of the statutory meeting. We want to see that in section 574 subsection 3. 574 subsection 3. I told you that if you fail to deliver this, hold this meeting or deliver this report, it is a ground to wind up the company. It means that you are not serious. Are you with me? Yeah, you are not ready to just close the company. Close the company. So, however, if you approach the court to say, my lord, please close this company, com compulsorily wind up this company for failure to hold this meeting or to deliver this report, the company may have a defense and say, my lord, we had some challenges. Are you with me? Uh, the courts could be on strike. I made you close court in for uh, uh, how many months now? One year. One year. Anything will happen. So if your reason for not holding the meeting is valid, then the courts may extend time. You want to see the case of Guardian Experience Bank, but of you will see that in slide 12 when I send it to you. Slide 12 of my slides. You see the citation and all that. So. I think we should leave the uh, statutory meeting and move to the AGM. So what is the AGM? It's the annual general meeting. Please look up annual general meetings must, and not just to emphasize that they are no longer compulsory for uh, SMC, small uh, one-man company or single member company and for private, small private companies. A small private company need not hold an AGM any longer. I think this is done, first of all, to make the operations uh, more flexible. Are you with me? Yes. Make it easier for them to operate. They may still hold if they want to, but it's no longer compulsory. It is only when they are, it's a large private company, and what would use to determine whether a private company is large or small is the turnover. Turnover. You look at that in section two, 394. 394. We'll look at it when we come to finance and uh, accounts. 394. The turnover of the company must be in excess of uh, 120 million or such amount as CAC by regulation may prescribe. And the assets of the company together must be up to 60 million or such amounts as CAC by uh, regulation may prescribe. There are a number of other conditions, but these are the main factors we look at. Are you with me? And the company can be small this year and not small next year. How is that so? Hmm? Yes, turnover may increase. Assets may increase. So a company is not permanently small, that's what I was saying. It can be large today and small tomorrow. So during the period when you are small, you don't have to hold AGM. The moment you have now become big, you must come and hold in Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So, again, I pointed out that the AGM must be held once in every, how many months? 15, 15 months. Once in every 15 months. At the same time, it must be held annually. How is that so? How is that so? Brian, how is that so? Okay, you calculate from the period um, the company is incorporated, you calculate it to about 15 months. And sometimes, if the company is incorporated in August, you cannot hold that meeting in that year. For example, 2030 is so every August, you cannot hold that company that year. That means in that year, but you calculate from that period to 15 months and that means to the next year before you can have the annual journey. Do you agree with her? Do you agree with her? You are sure? Okay. Yes, my daughter, let me hear you. 
Your name again? Eh? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It has to be held in the next year. Yes. Whether or not within a month So if it's held in the next year, it's still within the fifteen So that you have fifteen months does not mean that you must Yes, let me hear you, sir. Ma. Every year, 2002, 2003, 2004. Remember that between 2003 and 2004, you are talking about 24 months. Is that also? Yes. yes. So you can hold the first AGM in January of 2023, and uh, the next AGM was not exceed April of 2024. Is it April or even March? Are you with me? Yes. yes. So you don't have that liberty that because it must be held every year. You hold one January in uh, 2022, 23, and hold the next one December. Uh, that is not, <laughs> you have violated the spirit of the law because you are now holding it in almost two years. Are you with me? Yes. yes. So that is the first thing I want to say. But just to emphasize that a newly incorporated company need not hold its first AGM this year or next year, you can hold it the third year, provided it does so within an 18 months bracket. I said that in the audio now. Yes. Good. So I don't need to emphasize. So go through. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies. Next time will be better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I think I have emphasized. Again, just to point out that the Corporate Affairs Commission may extend time. So you have 15 months. CSC can still give you three months more. But for a newly incorporated company that already has 18 months, CAC cannot increase to make it 21 months. You have to go to the court. Otherwise, you are already in a violation. Ordinary business, what is an ordinary business? Yes, sir, you. <coughs> we say this meeting, we are going to hold ordinary business. We don't have any special, what we are going to address in the meeting is ordinary business. What are those things? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I hope you are hearing him. Yes. Those of you who are not uh, up and doing, you are hearing this young man. Thank you. Sit down. Pastor Henry, come and sit close to me. Can we continue? Yes. Good. So, what is a special business? This is my daughter. What is a special business? Every other business. Good. Good. <laughs> This is close to me. Okay. Now, just to point out again, under section 237, so the AGM, your focus when you are looking at the AGM is section 237. 237 of Kaman. In the company defaults in calling for an AGM, then certain things may happen. Number one is that Corporate Affairs Commission may call for one. That is the first thing. CAC itself may call for that meeting. Two, CAC may direct that one meet, such a meeting should be called. Three, CAC may give a direct and CAC may give a direction, including the fact that one member may apply to the court to call and hold the meeting. I'll take it again. Number one, CAC may call for the meeting. Two, it can give a direction that the meeting should be called. Three, it can authorize a single member to apply to the court for the authority to call for that meeting. Why is this possible? Because I told you that uh, people who are mischievous will not want to call for meetings. Uh, because that is where people want to task them, ask them questions, challenge them. And then, uh, so it, they may just choose not to call for meetings. And where that is the case, the Corporate Affairs Commission may intervene as the case may be. Is that clear so far? So among other things, it may allow a single member to approach the court for the authority to call for 
the uh, the yeah for the meetings. Okay, so we, let's talk about the EGM. I've already talked about it. Who can requisition the EGM? First of all, what is an EGM? And for Cados, what is an EGM? What does it? What do you use for? It's an extraordinary general meeting. Mm -hmm. It's really called where the the important uh, matter that should be discussed before. In that cannot wait. That, that cannot wait for the next annual general Excellent. Meeting. Excellent. That is how it should be. Example is the... Um, example is what? Example is if there is a serious loss of capital. Excellent. Yes. Section 137. Yes. Yes. Thank God. You know, Jesus Christ taught his disciples until... <laughs> <laughs> until in John chapter 16, he now told them, you, you believe at last. You know, so he has been talking to them from John chapter 1 till... It's in John 16 that I say, now we believe that you are the son of God. Jesus said, Kai, so you finally believe. <laughs> so for you people, I would say, you finally understood. Yeah. Thank God. Okay. The light now is beginning to, oh, I see, I see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so just to emphasize that the EGM is very important because emergencies may occur. Things may happen. <laughs> you need to call a meeting quickly to address them. Like, for example, now, and you are about to appoint a new VC. Our super achieving VC is leaving us. His tenure is ending any moment from now, maybe the next five, six months. So we needed to set up two committees, Senate committees, to be involved in the selection process. That cannot wait for the next Senate meeting. And so the day before yesterday, we had an EGS, <laughs> Extraordinary Senate meeting. Are you with me? to quickly address the matter. And such meetings are usually to just address special business. You don't normally address a, an ordinary business in a, an EGM. Are you with me? Yes. Quickly you address the matter and then you take a decision as the case may be. Okay, just again to point out, uh, so can somebody help us to tell us about the How do we requisition? Who calls for these meetings? First of all, can somebody help us? Who calls for these meetings? The EGMs. Yes, Chinon, so help us. Okay. No, let uh, our brother help us. I keep forgetting your name. Mr. Benson. Sylvester. Mr. Sylvester. Okay, Mr. Sylvester. The chairman of the is Sherwood. Okay. Does somebody agree with him? No. Who calls for the meeting? Yes, the director. Of course, he's right in a sense. In a, he's, he's right because eventually the chairman will still tell the secretary. Um, but for our own purpose, just say the directors. So the board of directors will direct the secretary to call for the EGM. And of course, this is a special business. You must. The difference between special business and ordinary business is that for ordinary business, you don't need to write out what you are going to discuss. Once you just say it's to address ordinary business, it is now implied that those are the matters we want to look at. For special business, you must, you must itemize it and give us enough details. If you don't, when we reach that meeting, you will not raise it up. I don't know if you are clear. So that is the first person, the director. Secondly, who else can call Augustina? No, before you come to the members, who else can call? A single director. If the directors are abroad, good. So number three now, let's get our sister Augustina. Okay, again, just thank you for that. Just again to remind you that company law caters for share capital companies and non-share share capital companies. And so whenever we are talking about decisions taken by uh, non-share capital companies or guarantee companies, decisions are arrived at on personal basis because you don't vote according to your investment because you don't invest in a guarantee company. I've emphasized it enough. Is that also? Yes, sir. Yes, so you always see the difference between 15% of members or 15% of the shares, usually the nominal value of the shares and all. Okay, so tell us how, how what is the process for requisition and calling of these meetings by members. Yes, my dear. Tell us the procedure. Mm -hmm. 
Lauda. Okay, can somebody put, thank you for that effort. Can somebody put in a better way for us? Sir. Yes, um, brother. Um, in case something serious happens in the company, the members think it fits that uh, an EGM should be held. They can inform the directors to call for an EGM. Then Not they, inform, they are requisitioning. They can, they can the yes. It's more like a demand. That, yes, demand. Then uh, if the directors fail to do that between, within 21 days. 21 days. Is it the difference between A and C? Are you the difference? Yes. She will still pass, so, but you see, I make. I write now, boss, sir, I write, boss, sir, I write. That is why you had a C. Okay, go on. So, if they fail to do that within 21 days, then the members can go ahead to hold the meeting. They can go ahead, first of all, to call for the meeting and then hold it. Then, any cost that we could have been to will be borne by the company. The Lord did not say the director, you will be borne by the company. Yes. But we can imply, we can imply that the company can. Seek indemnity from the director. Are you with me? Now, also, who else can requisition an EGM? My son. Who else? You. Yeah, what's your name, sir? Emmanuel. Okay. Who else can requisition an EGM? Yes, under what instance? <coughs> it's okay, you can sit down. Thank you. At least he, he remembered the detail. I thought he would never remember anything. You know, because he just come in. This is his first day in the class. And he remembered <laughs> the auditor. Let's clap for him. Let's clap for him. Yeah. <laughs> so the auditor, an auditor who is retiring. Are you with me? He's retiring or he's resigning. But he feels that there are crucial facts that the directors are aware of, but the members should also be aware of. Yeah, are you with me? Yeah. Particularly, of course, we're talking about fraud. It's usually fraud. You know, so he can requisition. What Kama did not provide is Kama does not appear to authorize him to call. It does for members, but it appears not to authorize the uh, auditor to call this meeting. Now, you look at, I've talked about section 137, that is compulsory. That is when an EGM must must be called on serious loss of capital. Okay, so I think uh, uh, sorry. we are done. Let me just point out one slide more, and then I can give you time to go and rest. Okay, so place where these meetings are to be held. Can somebody tell us about what you know about where, where can these meetings be held? AGM, PGM, uh, statutory meetings. Which place can we hold them? Can somebody help us? Section 240. Yes, can somebody help us? Mabode, can you help us? Okay, so first thing to emphasize, please listen, is that apart from small companies and SMCs, all statutory and annual general meetings must be held in Nigeria. So that means that EGM for all companies, small or big, private or whatever, an EGM can be held anywhere. That is the idea because the express exclude, express uh, mention one thing of one thing is the exclusion of the other. Is that also? So small companies and SMCs may hold their AGMs outside Nigeria. That is what it means now. So small companies and SMCs may hold their AGMs anywhere in Nigeria or outside Nigeria. But for public companies and large private companies, they must hold such meetings inside where Nigeria. So note that. Also, just to emphasize that private companies may, if allowed by the articles, also hold their meetings 
electronically or virtually. So those are some of the things I want us to know. I think we'll call it a date. And I will discuss with Perwe and see if we can have one hour for tomorrow. And then uh, see how God will help us.